Hands are going up like flowers today. <laughs> okay, who's really ready to ask a question? At the back there, you can come. Yeah. Namaste, Moji. Namaste, thank you. When I'm in, uh, be aware of the isness, I'm in there. There's be uh, a watcher to be observed of the isness. A watcher to observe the isness. Yeah, because when I'm in the isness, in the, in the, in the stillness of the isness, it can be watched because I am experience the yeah. isness. Yeah. So the watcher is inside the isness itself. So who is it who watches the isness? The idea. The idea that you are separate for now. Okay. You see? The idea that you are separate for now and that it's important to, to keep watching the isness. As the watching continues, you see, the sense of separation is lost. Just like if your name is John, when the body was born, I didn't come out from mom with John on the head of it, it's just no. baby. And then for a while baby doesn't even know, they say, okay, what should we call the boy? So, uh, Jeffrey, no, I don't like Jeffrey. What about George? No, not George, no, John. John, John, okay? So, baby don't know John. So then mother and father decide to John. Then they say, hello, John, John. Baby doesn't know John, no? <laughs> doesn't know mother yet, doesn't know doctor, doesn't know hospital, nothing, doesn't know baby even, okay? But at some point, it begins to develop the, the conscious, the developing consciousness can begin to identify it with the name, uh, John, John. Once this name um, um, crystallizes, somehow, it, it, it never forgets. And yet, you know, it's like it's not going around, I'm John, I'm John, I'm John, I'm John. So, Hello, yes, I'm John. I'm John yes. It's not doing this, but it cannot forget it. It's not like it's in a state of actual memory, I've got to remember I'm John. Maybe the child, at a certain point in its life, you know, when it might go out to play for the first time, the parents may write the name and stick it in the pocket, just in case he wanders off, somebody fall, meet this child and say, Hello, where are you going? What's your name? Boy. Where do you live? House. <laughs> Not going to be helpful, so mom will have to find a look and say, Oh, then they find something. As soon as it accepts these, these ideas, they become like a fact to it, and it's, 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 it never forgets them. It never really forgets it. That even if you're going a bit to sleep, and somebody calls, George? Jeffrey? John, huh? Is it, is it remembering? So, in the same way that even your phenomenal name, the name that was offered to you, is not forgotten, how much can you forget that which causes the, the impression of the name, which holds the name in memory, which is consciousness? Actually, you cannot forget it. We are taught that we can forget, and then it became a reality. Therefore, I say, I am before the idea that I could forget myself, or the idea that I need to remember myself was learned or believed. There is something so fundamental. Your being and you are one. But uh, now, because we, uh, we came into the culture of identifying as, uh, as the person, which is a developed mode from consciousness, 
we forget that's what we are. And now we have to learn or remember that we are consciousness. And that's why we can say, when I am in the isness, I could equally ask, when are you not as the isness? But because of our cultural um, identity and habit, that will seem, well, yes, but I do have to consciously remember. So say, in the beginning, we have to practice a lie, in a sense, something like in order to stabilize the truth again. Yeah. Uh, it's for, for me, strange. it's just like I'm in a room, you know, with all the doors closed and there's no light. Yes. When I open the door, the light comes in. Yes. When I close the door, there's no light. Yes. So it's like like yes. the yesness is then if there's no watcher, where's the yesness? Yes. Well, you already just said that if you were a part of that, it says that whether um, does it depend upon your belief? Mm. I don't know what your answer was at this time. But if, say, if it, does it depend on your belief or upon your memory? I didn't know if I added memory into that mix. But does it? We can add it now. Does it, does it depend upon your memory? Your, you know, like this. Now we have to start looking at who you are. Mm. You see, we speak of the isness. We've come to a recognition of something very profound. And who is it that's recognizing it? Yes. You see, who is recognizing it? The one who feel that I am separate from it, you know, which is a mode of consciousness mm. that is expressed or displayed in time and change mode. So for a while the consciousness, having adopted the body as its root and anchor and believed itself to be a person for a long time, and living in the limited mode of personhood for a while, until for whatever reason it's now time to evolve to a higher stage of consciousness, now is born as a seeker. Somehow it is born, just like before you, we say, we just had a child, now we just had a baby. No? And then, but uh, the, so the parents give birth to the baby, but the baby give birth to the parents, because before you were not parent. Mm. So by having a baby, you say, I have baby, but the baby sort of gave you the title of parent. You see? And it's the same way. We are the consciousness. But somehow, when we we've forgotten that, we, it's like we, we we are meant to forget it. That's why it's called in the state of ignorance. We take ourselves to be this construct called a person, and that's how we live. The consciousness has a lost, strong sense of individuality. But as it grows in maturity towards its own source, the sense of itself as an isolated, independent entity begins to thin away. Okay. It starts to feel itself more as a field, and so. The the search begins, and then we take the label of a seeker. But all of that is a movement inside the great isness itself. It's like it's sitting on the great egg of the universe, and everything is slowly hatching into an awakening of what it is. It's it's just a way of expressing that. There are many ways of expressing this, depending on what field of belief or paradigm we this. But this I feel is not a bad way. We, the seeking happens. This is why I said before, the one who begins the inquiry or the invitation will not finish the inquiry or the invitation, but will be finished by the inquiry. You see? It, it's, it comes quite true now, you see. You start out as a journeyer and you end up as the destination. <laughs> then somebody goes, No, no, but I want to experience arriving at the destination. You see? It's like you've always been the destination. Uh, but who was the seeker? Our dreamed self has been the seeker. We've always been the isness, but in our dreamed state we imagine ourselves as a journeyer towards the 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 isness. I don't know if that satisfies it satisfies me somehow that to feel <laughs> that yeah aha so that yes, of course, it's clear. It becomes clearer and clearer. You see, at okay. some point, the, is, the, 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 the separate seeker idea drops away when it's not needed anymore. Mm. It was uh, like that in the beginning. Tremendous energy. You see, it's like if you watch uh, one of these launching of some spaceship or something, some rocket. Tremendous fuel, 
and it's blazing fuel, and then it goes, what force, what power, going, 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 going. But when it reaches that particular orbit of non-gravity, then the hardware falls away, and it's just floating into emptiness, isn't it? So we have this hardware, no? And we're <laughs> in life, you know. <laughs> but the, the, at some point, we come more into the field of uh, discovering our natural state, and things become easier. It's good that the early stages are difficult and challenging, so you have to push and push a bit. And as you come into greater heights, it becomes less, you see, and more. Then it becomes effortless. Then you realize that it has always been that effortlessness has always been here, with the mask of the effortful over it or something. Thank you, Moji. Thank you. Thank you for calling my name. My name is Thank John you. as well. John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Feel of isness um, shifted a bit. Is it faded a little bit? His mind is coming up. Has isness moved over? This is uh, why so many beings they are again in this state of joy. Natural happiness, you see, and this happiness is not about an event. Is the isness an event? No. So it's not because oh you've got a raise or you've got you know you got engaged today or something. You, somehow it's inherent in the being, this natural joy and peace. So even when we did not feel it, it was there. You had to be conscious about it. And I gave the one story that um, I feel also expresses this very well. It was a story of two boys who grew up in a town, and they were been friends from uh, as soon as they met. They grew up like this. They always met in the same place, sit on a bench in the middle of town, and they would talk, they talk their souls out to each other. Everything, no secrets was held. So just to keep it simple, one I'm going to call A, another one B. Okay, like this. So they are very close. They are very, very close. And as they grew up, through teenage years, they grew into men, and Mr. Hay got married. And uh, had a son, and like this. And uh, B, uh, he likes traveling, seeing the world, and so on. But whenever he travels, he come back and he meets his friend, and they would sit and they would just have so much to talk, and so much love is there, you know, like that. So uh, what happened is that uh, in adulthood, no, Mr. A and Mr. B met, and they were talking. And and B says, "You know, I, I, I feel to go travelling again very soon." So his friend, Mr. A, says, "Listen, I, I just have a strong feeling to tell you something. I've not shared with you this before, but I think it's time. I'm not feeling so well these days. And you know, I just want to tell you that I received a large inheritance from my, from my family, and um, I didn't want to." Disclose this to my wife because she she just spends money like drinking water, you know, and uh, you know I think that she would spoil our son with all this buying things all the time. So I have put the money in the box, you see, gold actually, and I've put it under the house. I just I just feel I have to tell you this. So B says, okay, okay. What's wrong with you? He says, I don't know. I'm 
I was so afraid to go to doctors and so on. Anyway, uh, time come and B travels, went travelling for six years, he was travelling around. And then after six years, he had the feeling to return home. In those days, there was no internet and things like that. So he came home, and as soon as he arrived in the centre, the bus stops and everything, and he gets off and he's walking, he sees uh, the wife of his friend begging on the street. Like this, she's begging, you know. And uh, he walks over to her, he says, Amma, you know, she looks at him. Oh, I know you. You were my husband's best friend. Yes, but why were we our best friends? You don't know what happened? No, what happened? Oh, A passed away some three years ago, and uh, we have no money. I have to beg every day, and uh, we are hungry. We hardly get any food each day. Uh, so B says to her, Look, I am so sorry to hear this. I, I really, really miss him now. So much looking forward to meeting, but I'm so sorry. But anyway, um, Mother, I have some good news for you. So the moment he mentioned the good news, you see, her heart begins to lift up the clouds on this, because she knows that he's a trusted uh, person. Huh? He says, uh, "Come with me. Come with me." So they went there and says, "You know where I can get a shovel or something? Shovel? What for? Just go to a shovel." So they went and they got a shovel from a neighbor. Went back to the house and she he told her, "Your husband confided in me that he had saved all this money, but he was always afraid to let you know about it because he thought you'd just waste it, and he couldn't bear the thought of that." So what happened? He told me he buried this money under the house. Come, let's go and look. So immediately they removed some floorboards and they started digging and digging and digging and digging. Maybe fifteen minutes they are digging, and then suddenly, thump, 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 and then ah, they start to quick. Found a box, and inside the box was all the all the wealth she could imagine would be there. All the money she could conceive of, even dream about. Now, my point is that uh, this money was always there, and it belonged to her. But was she rich? You see, it was always there, but was she rich? No, still poor. Why? Because she was not aware of it. All this that we are sitting here talking is the same story. It is always here. I asked you in satsang, you are discovering this today, but where has it been all this time? And you had to admit it was always here. How could you answer these kind of questions that scientists can't answer, they can't answer? Maybe they're trying to study it in something like this, I don't know. They cannot answer. How can you answer? Of what, of what value are your answers? If why I ask you also, leave the mind, <coughs> the tendencies and habits aside. Because if I had not uh, done this, when I asked those questions, you would have answered with opinions. The room would have become noisy. But because you were not given that facility to go back into your speculation and so on, you were answering the answers were coming from another place, a deeper place, a knowing place. But it is not uh, knowledge, it's not holding it like knowledge, it's just a knowing. It's fresh, you see. And this must again become our natural place. Now that you have discovered, and the discovering will continue also, yielding fruit, insight, intuition, you see, 
more and more. And what do you have to do? And just keep being with it. And the life will always be giving us some clues, whoever you are, wherever you may be, actually. Some clues will come. And now also that you are more sensitized to that subtle realm, if you want to call it for the moment, you'll be able to notice these clues more. And the more you notice them, the more the better you'll be become at recognizing them, the more intuitively sensitive you become. And it is like learning the the ABC of God's language. You become more intuitive, more sensitive, not only understanding words in their dictionary importance, but the energy and the, the intuitive, the spirit inside them, which is yourself. And so, more than uh, this obsession or this strong habit of thinking life, you are you are life, and at the same time, the unfolding flow of life is watched in you by you. Now, how near to you is this understanding? Thank you. Love you. Ah. Um, okay, let's start first. Um, my daughter died a few months ago, and uh, if I make it really still inside, silence, then I can feel her. She's like we are one. But then the grief starts again, and, and um, it's very difficult to stay with that silence. And, that, and now my question is, um, what happens with the isness when the body dies? Where did the response come from when I would ask you, can it die? And without deliberating so much about it, it came out of you, it cannot die. What in you can know that? Is it the mind? What in you can know? I mean, any of these questions, well, not any, but some of these questions, uh, people have been deliberating about them for centuries and centuries. Can they be proven? And so on. I don't want to go into a, a laboratory to talk with you, unless it's the lab of your own heart. You can look, and uh, can you, if a scientist was, or someone, I'm not putting up there, great scientists also, but if, say, the typical kind of way we think someone were to come and refute your experience and say to you, you know, well, there's no way you could know this. There's absolutely no way you can know this. It's not a fact. It cannot be proven. Goodbye. Next. OK? Will you be walking out with your tail between your legs, all crushed? Or could you stand in the authority of what you see? Is there an authority arising in you to say no? This, 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 is, this is real for me. Would, on hearing such a response from someone, you start to doubt maybe the isness does fade or something? 
which is greater, the isness or the self you are speaking from at the moment. Because you, when you refer to yourself, it is not the same self which I ask you, how near to the isness are you? You are speaking from uh, the mode of a mother or of this I am this body idea. Hmm. And when the I am the body idea fall, it can fall without death, without physical death. This I am the body idea actually is, um, is thinning away. Is that something to grieve about itself even? You see, as you are experiencing, you see, a lot, we have a lot of myths about life. But now I want you to live in the proof of yourself and to see what happens to those myths. <coughs> myths mean something you believe in, but it's not the proof. I would rather that we are speaking on a level that is, that is experiential, that you can speak from your experience, more than just ask you to believe in this, believe in that. Belief has its place, it is a tremendous uh, power, uh, as such as faith also. Faith is actually naturally increasing with your seeing and the trust. So you say, when after death, actually, death is a small thing. Do you think we are first timers on this planet with this life death thing? Uh, you say, after the birth, can the isness survive? Everything else will pass except it. Everything else. This is what I want to see. If you have proven this, you see, or if it has been proven to you that uh, in respect to, to that which we, we are we are saying it's formless and, and uh, it cannot come and go, it cannot fade, it's as though we are re reporting about something tangible and something that the mind would ordinarily feel it can measure and qualify and quantify. But it is not this. How can you speak about that which is without form, without shape, without size, that is not born? How can you speak uh, with such comfort? Does it have any meaning, or are we just playing about? So your question, you see, does the does the isness survive the death of the body? We give the death of the body such great importance. God has used his body also as a metaphor, also. That every night you go to bed, you know, and if you fall into sleep, then you know, it's it's a kind of metaphor of death also. You have no identity, you have no relatives, you're not a mother, father, uncle, sister, nothing at all is there. Does it mean that your reality is broken? Let's Let's take a little time and look at it, no? because it, uh, the sense of death, I say death is one of God's great ideas, because it so terrifies uh, the living beings, that it also supports and compels us to search for something which is imperishable. Also. And we are experiencing many forms of death and rebirth in our general life. also. The death of many ideas is a form of death, perhaps it's a greater death. The death of the of the of the, the smallness of yourself is also a kind of a good death. Healthy. But if you mean that at one point where it is because what is the fear of death? Uh, perhaps the greatest is the, the loss of attachment or the fear of the end of experiencing. And we have reports from so many also people who we call have experienced NDE or near death experiences also that have come back and said, This old thing about death, pfft, I'm not at all worried about it anymore. <coughs> we need to die a bit more. <laughs> and in a sense, awakening is a kind of dying, dying to what is not true. And look how we feel. And also, we go to sleep every night. No? And I said many times in the past, you know, a sensible person spends you know, so much money to buy the best bed. What for? To forget about everything, <laughs> including the bed. 
and uh, even your beloved you cannot take with you, even yourself you cannot take, even your idea of yourself cannot come into that place with you, where everything is left. Hmm? And yet, uh, nobody goes to bed screaming. I don't want to go into that no, that no person state anymore. Don't you go into a place, absolutely no person state? And you know, the question has been asked before, um, uh, were you there in sleep? Do you enjoy sleep? I'm not talking about dream now. Do you, do you enjoy sleep? Which is the, the absence of cognitive functioning, meaning that there's no you and me and this and that and, and right and wrong and enemies and friends. I feel I would prefer that uh, someone uh, don't say to me sweet dreams. The waking state is already full of dreams. No, dead sleep. <laughs> dead sleep. I don't want to know nothing at all. You know, it's dead sleep. Hmm? Because only in dead sleep, then in the morning, one wakes up refreshed. Phew, that was really good, you know, really sound sleep. Why dreaming? This, this, this waking state enough is of dreaming. As I said, each morning we wake up from, you know, from sleeping, but to be awake in the way that I'm speaking, you must also wake up out of the waking state. Because in the waking state, if you know we are awake, but if you don't know who you are, we are still asleep to what is true. And the biggest kind of sleep, a sleep in which we dream, we know so many things, but the knower of knowledge we don't know. You see? So you say, you lost your daughter some months ago, and when you are uh, quiet and, and so on, you can feel the sense of oneness mm -hmm. with her. But then when grief sweeps in, you see, and then uh, there's kind of turmoil. Grief has its place also. Hmm? But um, with understanding and knowing really what she is, or rather knowing who you are, you will come to terms with this much, much better. You will know who she is. You see, something is gone, something is perishable. Even the body, I don't know, it's more recyclable. You see? And, uh, that, uh, and uh, the kind of thinking, who should she takes herself to be most strongly, has a kind of generative force and will give a certain kind of experiencing for a time, you see, of a much higher state of life than we are experiencing on the earth. You see? But what we are speaking here, actually, when I speak like this, uh, sometimes I say, I want to, to invite you beyond heaven. It sounds a terrible thing to say, but uh, I don't mean any disrespect to that, because if it is a world, again, of, of, of images and pictures, they will also be existing in some mode of time. And <clears throat> maybe, you, maybe you say, we will never change. That means that you will never grow, then. Uh, there must be something. I am not dismissing that. But when we point to that, which is, uh, the heaven must be within you also. As are hellish states possible to be experienced within you. Have I gone too far to say this? You see? When you came to a place beyond the names and forms, like this, you see, did you feel something is desperately missing in you? Of course, we have this tangible, dynamic realm of life, where the relations are still there, and some, somehow we are moving in that. And that is, for me, fine also. I have got nothing against the dynamic expression of consciousness. What happens to that world is that finding who you are here, you see, it, it enriches your experience, in fact, uh, as a, a field of harmony. It becomes much more an expression of the oneness, in fact. 
So form or no form are still inside the one. You see? So yes, uh, we are afraid uh, to, that anything happens to our attachments, basically. And it seems that that's the worst thing that can happen in life, is that the thing that we most value, something upsets us because something interferes with that. But I say, keep growing inside, keep growing into your understanding. Do you feel drawn in some way to dedicate you know, your energy to going more deeply into what you are discovering today? Nobody has anything to say about that. You see? This is why I say, my God, you don't realize what you are discovering. And don't give it to your mind. Because the way that we may be thinking, because of the motherly attachments, fatherly attachments and so on, the way that you may be imagining is not the state she's in necessarily. You see? You maybe feel, oh, you know, I wonder if everything is okay with you and this kind of and you know, the whole of that area I would just say just offer it to the Supreme, offer it to God. You know? You continue with this life force that is put in this body and the urge, the capacity to search uh, for higher, to go higher and higher in terms of your um, your understanding and experience into this. And it will inform you of what you need to know, if there are other things you need to know. In the, in the more dynamic realm, you may come to find them out. But so great is this, you see, because you are not discovering about yourself as a person. You are discovering in yourself the allness of things. And if our person is so dear to us, this is where your energy will go, to protect the sense of your person and its world. If you see that uh, uh, in any mode of consciousness, such as the person realm, it gives um, some uh, sense of some comfort. We like the relationships. I like being me. And, uh, this is fine. I don't want to disturb that. You go ahead. It's fine. Because it's a question of timing and maturity. When we come to a stage when you feel actually I'm more open to, to that, to just allowing that space to be taught from inside, then you see that again you're raising up. And as much as uh, this evolving movement is there, on each step, as I said earlier, it's like a platform. And that platform is working on higher states of consciousness. It's much more subtle. And as you go higher still, it gets more subtle like this. Because the gross identity of personhood, with all of its um, uh, fears and judgments and, and harshness and so on, you have transcended them. Where are you going to transcend them? Right here. I want to ask you, from that place of that recognition, have you slipped? You see? And yet there is space for these questions. They can come, you can look at them, but there is still somehow the sense that all in the world of names and forms, in the, in the theatre of consciousness, all these movements, there is no need to try and arrest them. Let them flow. You see? It is your consciousness that will read them and determine what they are for you. The more you are relating from the perspective of person, the more, um, I would say, uh, volatile, the more insecure that, f that sense is there. And sometimes we have to revisit the whole states to see, you know, like, wait, I used to live in this neighborhood for a long time. But now something doesn't want to be there. Now it's, it's a higher state of, of being and seeing, you see. Hmm. So when the grief comes, let it come. 
But as you get more clear within your heart, you'll see that uh, you may choose, you know, don't, uh, don't celebrate or make anniversaries out of your pain. Uh, come, it's fine. You're not doing a disservice uh, to your loved ones by being in pain. They don't want that, you see. But in any case, you know, stay with what is possible in you. Hmm? What is it that is here? If we don't let the attention slip into these modes, in these rooms of past and future, and, uh, and the habit of, you know, covering over the freshness of now with interpretations and so on, what actually is here? What exactly are you? We intuitively know that we exist, and that we are perceiving. Is it important to know more? Well, yes, it is important to be more clear, because when we say we know that we are, if we don't go more deeply into an experiential clarity of this, we may feel that we are just existing as person. And a person is a very restrictive, very narrow uh, form of consciousness. And we can stay in these modes for a very, very long time, lifetimes maybe. So recognizing that even the person is largely ideas and memory, and that that is observable. The thoughts and the feelings, they come in seeming, unending succession, they are coming. Can any of them be what you are? Because if your thoughts and feelings are what you are, and they come and go, then when they go, you would also be gone. But you are aware, you were there before they appear. You are here during their appearance. You are here after they depart. How you can be them? In fact, you know, I even wonder if I should even be having this talk with you right now. Perhaps after the invitation, I should just uh, say, you know what? I go in your cocoon and just marinate in that in that isness. Be like the jacket potato in your foil and just marinate. It doesn't mean think, you know, think, think, but just just be. Maybe it might be experienced as a kind of shock to the system, but quite likely not. Maybe it just uh, it is so natural state. Maybe it's a surprise for some people that they're not thinking. Because for some beings, the waking state is synonymous with thinking and doing. Like from the moment you are become conscious, you know, your mind is in some gear or something. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, reverse, but rarely neutral. And now you are being introduced to that neutrality of being. So the gears have a greater sense of what they are for you.
I said also that mm, within us is the capacity to uh, move to higher states of consciousness. But there is also a power within us that seems to work to keep you in the mode of personhood. And for a long time it can feel it is the easiest state to be in. It is so practised, so rehearsed, we are so cultured, it seems our very existence seems to promote personhood. And yet, for those who have come to the place where they have learned to, to observe, just begin to observe, without identifying with what is observed. You see, that even the reflexes of, you know, action, reaction, interaction are observed without an even a blip in the inside. Watch from this place. You know, are you dead? In the recognition of such stillness, such peace, such spaciousness beyond time, beyond shape. Are you sustaining anything at all? Or can't you wait to get back to the mind? Who can say? So we are going to take a break for lunch now, and uh, it will be so much uh, uh, good that we just move in this, move to your heart's wish. But watch this isness. Does it move? You see? And don't try to. Do any strange thing. You just well, you can if you want to see if the isness, see if the isness is strange. You know. Can it be lost? And yet we can have a sense that uh, we have moved away from it. Who is the we? You see. Uh, for many years, I was sharing with what we call self-inquiry. And self-inquiry was uh, the path also expounded and and encouraged by Ramana Maharishi, also Papaji and uh, Sri Shankara. It's a very very powerful path, you see, and it supports the invitation tremendously for those of you who may have uh, some. Experience with it, but from time to time it is necessary. I bring this some few pointers from this from this uh, beautiful um, path to to look at where the mind wants to go to escape. And I say, well, if mind is playing any antics, there is something that is already aware of it, and there is a sense of choice. What is the choice? Just to stay as you are. Or to go with the pull of the mind and to engage and to proliferate into more thoughts or something. So, some discipline, a natural and very healthy and enjoyable discipline, begins to emerge that is not a strain, it is not tiresome, you see. Thank you. We're having some 
this guy. Very beautiful. If you feel that the sense of personhood, the sense of identity is thinning away, don't panic. It's the most beautiful thing, because you are here to watch the sense of thinning away. So,
you learn that in just one morning. Very good. Well, is it very good? Yes. Yeah. Oh,